we are standing on the edge of a major transformation in the world that we live in. There are two technologies in particular that are about to completely change our lives. First, we're going to see 5G networks change our world. And if somehow you've been able to escape all the hype of 5G before now, tell me your secret, because I want to know it. But second of all, 5G networks are about bringing the next generation of wireless right to our devices. It, it, the way to explain it, it's like having a fiber optic connection right to your phone. Just imagine being able to download the entire eighth season of Game of Thrones in about 30 seconds. I mean, if we're talking about life-changing technology. But the interesting thing about 5G networks that some people don't realize is they're not really being built for us. They're being built for them. Gartner says that by 2020, there will be more than 20 billion smart devices on the planet. To put that in context, that's about three times the number of people in the entire world. Refrigerators that will do your shopping for you and have it delivered by a drone or robot. Cars that drive themselves, a whole new field of medicine known as telesurgery, where a doctor can perform an operation remotely on a patient anywhere in the world. By the way, every one of those examples already exists today. And if we behave nicely, the devices will let us use their network too. And there are some amazing possibilities beyond just downloading our favorite shows. Kids performing experiments on scanning electron microscopes at universities far from where their school is, Music performances where each member of an orchestra is participating with another member of the orchestra in another part of the world. But super fast connectivity is only part of the equation. With these new applications comes an enormous amount of decisions that will need to be made. Way more than we have the capacity to make as humans. Well, I'll speak for myself anyway. If I can get our four kids to the right soccer games on Saturday, I'm doing good. So I definitely don't have the capacity to make this many decisions. But that brings me to the second technology that will change our world in the next couple of years, and that's artificial intelligence. The computing power that we have at our fingertips today already is much greater than most of us have the ability to access because of today's user interfaces. The smartphone that you have in your pockets that some of you are holding up right now is 120 million times faster than the computers that were used to manage the first mission to the moon. We could do amazing things with the processing power that is already in our devices, but unlocking that power requires complex, laborious interactions with code. I, has anyone ever tried to do a mail merge? Just saying. But imagine for a second if we could take advantage of that computing power by just speaking or thinking. That future will be here sooner than you think. In fact, it's here now. Only 30% of people think that they're using AI today. The truth is, 80% of us already are. We use it every time we pay with a credit card to make sure there's no fraud. We use it every time we search for an image on a search engine. And we use it every time we tell our speaker, I want to watch some old friends. And it figures out that we're talking about old episodes of a TV show and not my buddies from high school. But what does all this mean for education. This is a picture that somebody hung up in my office uh, once. I love it. There's a guy over there with a book grinder, grinding the book so it goes into people's heads. This is by an artist named Jean-Marc Cote, and he did a series of paintings of what his world, the different parts of his world, would look like 100 years into the future. He's actually not that far off. But the interesting part about it, OK, so it might not look exactly like that. We'll, 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 let, we'll let that go. Uh, but when we think about what AI will do to transform schools, the ability to overcome language barriers, not being able to collaborate with someone because we don't speak the same language is a concept that our kids may never really experience by the time they get to the workforce. Overcoming physical limitations by using voice recognition, and certainly we can use AI as a powerful engine to control personalized learning. But despite all of the potential, there's a lot of worrying going on when it comes to AI. I was in a meeting in San Francisco recently, and I was driving down the street, and I saw this billboard. <laughs> it says, robots can't take your job if you're already retired. 
there is a widely cited prediction that many of you may have heard from the World Economic Forum that says by 2022, AI will eliminate 25 million jobs. But what's often not mentioned is the rest of the sentence. In that same study, if you keep reading, it says, according to their same research, AI will also add 133 million new jobs, and it will generate $3 trillion in business revenue. Just to put that in context, if AI was a country, it would be the fifth largest country in the world by GDP. So my message today is that when it comes to AI, we may be freaking out about the wrong thing. We shouldn't be so worried that there won't be job opportunities in the future. What we should be worried about is that our students won't have the skills they need to qualify for those jobs. How are we preparing our students to thrive in a world of high-speed networks and AI that they will face when they leave school? Well, maybe not as well as we should. ISTE recently conducted a study where we asked just teachers, we asked teachers to explain what AI was. 80% of them couldn't do it. And we're not the only ones noticing this trend. Uh, a little while ago, our team had an interesting conversation with the leaders at General Motors. They said, we have a workplace shortage, hoping you can help. We said, that's nice, not really what we do at ISTE, but good, good luck, I you know, hope that goes well. With they said, no, you don't understand. We have a workplace shortage problem in 10 years. You see, all of the cars that we're developing will essentially be drivable computers with a steering wheel, or maybe not even with a steering wheel. And in order to have the workforce that we need to design and build them, we need students today that are learning about AI in schools, and they're not. We said, well, there's this thing called the internet. I'm sure you could go and search and find some materials for teachers that could help. And they said, really, go try. So we had our research team go and search all over the place, and we found that there was nothing for teachers about how to talk about AI with students. Anyway, to make a long story short, we partnered with General Motors and created the first course to help teachers learn how to talk to students about artificial intelligence. It's already one of our most popular ISTU courses with teachers participating from almost every state and 10 countries around the world. But our collaboration with General Motors has opened my eyes to a bigger problem. I hear people talking about the amazing new world AI will bring, but they're not talking about the fact that in order to create that world, it's entirely dependent on teaching a whole bunch of new skills to millions of new people. Even education organizations are missing this. It, it won't just happen. Teachers are the link to the future. And while self-driving cars are pretty awesome, AI can do much more than just build cars. It's as much about creating and designing as it is about engineering and programming. My wife, Chandra, who's sitting right here and worried that I might work her into my talk, I won't do that, don't worry. Uh, she's a professional violinist. And the symphonies that she plays for centuries have been composed by somebody using paper and notes. Here's where all the music teachers in the room get mad at me. But the future of music composition is starting to look very different because of AI. Now composition is starting to happen by combining words and pictures and phrases to create music. In fact, at the end of this session today, you'll hear a song called Break Free, composed by Taryn Southern, completely composed using an AI tool called Amper. And by the way, if you want to try this yourself without buying special software, you can download the first ever AI-enabled Doodle, which you can go in, and, it, and some of you may have seen this, you can go in and you can choose a melody, and then it analyzes hundreds of Bach chorales to figure out exactly how Bach would have harmonized those notes if he had composed that melody. And then it generates an authentic Bach composition, even though he's been dead for a little while. It's not hype to say that we're behind the curve on teaching students about AI. The language of future problem solving will be the language of AI. And we're not creating a generation of students who understand this language. We need them to be able to ask the tough questions, not just can we build it with AI, but should we? Is it ethical? When AI has to make a life or death decision, how do we decide how to program it? How do we act when we're working on teams where members of our team aren't human? But perhaps the most important thing that will come out of all of this is it will force us to ask the question, what is uniquely special about being human? For 200,000 years, humans have had a monopoly on creativity, problem solving, and engineering. 
as that no longer becomes a uniquely human skill, what's left? Well, I hope it's things like kindness, empathy, and civility. Which brings me to my final point. Our 40th anniversary gives us a chance to reflect on what we've stood for in the last decade and what ISTE should stand for in the future. Last year at our conference in Chicago, we talked about the need to evolve our thinking around teaching digital citizenship. Far too often, digital citizenship is taught in a negative way. Here's the list of things not to do online. And while I deeply appreciate the intent behind all the anti-cyberbullying campaigns, we don't think other things as anti in our schools, right? I mean, we don't have like an anti-illiteracy campaign. We teach people to love to read, right? Digital citizenship shouldn't be a list of don'ts, but a list of do's. La Cañada School District in California decided instead of teaching anti-cyberbullying, they were going to start teaching their kids what it meant to be good cyber friends, which includes watching out for people who aren't being treated respectfully online. In addition to being more compelling, by the way, keeping it positive is actually something you can practice. You can't, you can't practice not doing something. The other thing we need to evolve is our thinking around recognizing that the skills required to thrive as a digital citizen go far beyond just online safety. It includes being respectful, of people with differing viewpoints from our own, recognizing fact from fiction online, using technology to engage in civil action, knowing how to have the right balance of activities online and offline, and of course, knowing how to be safe and also create safe spaces for others. These aren't skills that students are learning, by the way, by watching adults either, you may have noticed. So we also have to do a better job ourselves. Last year in Chicago, we challenged you to commit to doing at least one thing differently to teach digital citizenship in a positive, broader way. And we asked you to share your stories. We got so many stories, I wish I could take the time to share all of them with you. But let me just give one or two quick examples. Laura Carey, a fifth grade teacher in California, committed to modeling good digital citizenship by citing all of the sources that she used. In her words, no more snatching an image just because it's for my class or a technology integration specialist from Elk Grove USD who committed to supporting students in, again, in their words, using technology as a global microphone to connect communities beyond their classrooms. Unfortunately, the people who most need to hear this message aren't sitting in this room today. So we are planning a bold next step, and we need your help. ISTE, in partnership with like-minded organizations, is launching an international campaign around redefining digital citizenship. We're calling, uh, yes, you can clap for that, thank you. We're calling on students, educators, parents, and community members to take action in ensuring that our students have the skills they need to be effective digital citizens. The initiative will launch this fall, and over the next few months, we will be curating the best resources we can find to help teachers and parents talk to their kids about these important skills, and we'll be sharing them at digsitcommit.org. With your help, we have a shot at creating a radically better future. One of my favorite movies is a movie called Sliding Doors. Has anybody seen it with Gwyneth Paltrow? Yeah. Way not enough of you have seen it. You need to go and watch it. That's your homework. Go and watch that movie after this. For those of you who haven't seen it, I'm going to try to explain it without totally giving away the plot. So, sliding doors. So, Gwyneth Paltrow's running down, open, the movie opens, running down the stairs to catch a, a train in, in, in London's underground. She just barely makes it, the door's shut, and off the train goes. And then the movie stops, and it rewinds and goes back, and it starts again. The whole scene starts to play again, starts coming down. But this time, right before she gets to the platform, a kid kind of bumps into her and drops something, and she picks it up, and, and then she keeps running and just barely misses the train. Shoot, the door shut, and off the train goes. And from that point on, it begins two parallel universes, two movies that end up in very different places based on the Gwyneth Paltrow that caught the train and the one that didn't. By the way, it freaks me out every time I take the metro. I think about that as an incredibly powerful metaphor for where we are today. We are standing on the platform right now as a society, as a democracy, and we have a choice to make. One possible potential future is a world where we continue to devolve, continue to have hate and lack of tolerance online, continue to use technology in ways that are self-serving and divisive, or another universe 
when we're using technology to bring people together, to talk with people that we disagree with about important issues, to use technology to serve our community and make the world around us a better place, to give a voice to the voiceless. Please, please don't miss that train. Thank you.